Well, uh, you're in the book of John now. Uh, my message this morning comes from John 9.30. After Jesus, or when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. If you take notes, I've entitled uh, the message, It is Finished. It is Finished. Before we look at this, let's uh, pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit to open up our minds to it. Spirit of God, we do thank you that uh, we have so many truths. And here's one, Lord, uh, just before Easter, that, um, that we pray that you would help us to better understand, help us to better know what his death meant. Help us, Lord, to appreciate his death and the fact that it reaped for us so much. And we ask you, Lord, uh, to not only do that, but walk amongst us. And if there's one here today who knows not Christ as Savior, we pray that today he might meet the crucified Jesus and resurrected Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would draw them to yourselves. And for others, Lord, we pray you bring edification, you bring comfort, you bring hope. And Lord, pray you bring joy and peace to our hearts as we look into this wonderful verse. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. When, he had, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said it is finished, and he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. I dare say without doubt, without hesitation, there has never been any greater word spoken by any human being's lips, beyond anything. And there's never been anything that any human being has ever said that had a greater impact on mankind than Christ's last words. It is finished. You see, the lips that declared those words are the same lips that commanded in Genesis 1-3, let there be light the same person. And the moment he said, let there be light, that in an instant, the world lit up and a universe with countless stars was created with just four words. You know, they got this James Webb uh, telescope out there and it's uh, knocking science on its heels because of it's finding things that shows all the flaws in man's uh, understanding of, of the universe. And they're even talking now about an infinite universe. In just four words, Jesus said, let there be light. And all of infinity that we call the universe was created instantly. That's the sovereignty of God. So you see, the words it is finished, aren't words of just an ordinary man about to die. They're the divine words from the lips of the creator God himself. And the effects of those words, it is finished, cannot be measured. It cannot be calculated. They can't be weighed or even totally understood. They're so great. And those three words are also the key that unlocks the kingdom of God to all mankind. You must remember in the Old Testament, there was just the Jews. They were the only chosen people. Only they knew God. The Gentile word had their own gods, and it wasn't the God of Abraham. And when Jesus declared it is finished and he gave up the ghost, when he did that, the keys to death and hell were also given to him. Revelation 1, 17, 18 says, Fear not, for I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades, which is hell. With these words, or with the words, it is finished, every single prophecy, I forget how many there were, but there were a lot of them in the Old Testament were fulfilled. He fulfilled them all. 
and Christ, in doing that, he discharged the Old Testament, the Old Dispensation, and he ushered in the New, uh, the new Testament or the New Covenant, the New Dispensation of grace, no longer under law. Now we're under grace with the words, it is finished. For the first time, for the very first time, Gentiles would be called into God's family. Pro, uh, Psalms 86 9 says, All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. You have to understand something. Man has always been religious. There's always been religion since the beginning of time. Because uh, I think it's uh, Ecclesiastes 7.12 says, Eternity is written on man's heart. We know there's an afterlife. We know that. We sense that. We know we have a spirit. We know it. Lost or saved, we know it. And because of that, to know that now all nations, men and women from all nations, will be called by God into his kingdom. Before that, it didn't happen. You know the interesting thing to think about? When Israel in the Old Testament was the only one that was God's people, and all the other all the other nations around them, millions of people, they all had other gods. They were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. Look at today's, look at today. Fast forward to the 21st century. Is there any difference? Christ's name is mentioned all over the world. But it's but this is not mentioned with it that this is the authority. It's not. His name is mentioned. People know about him, but they want to accept him. The evangelical church, as we talked about this morning, wants to accept God on their terms, not, not the terms of this book, and that's what it was written for. That means because now he's calling uh, people from all nations, that means the reason, the absolute reason, you're sitting here today, you and I both, is simply because Jesus said, it is finished. And in doing that, we were all Gentiles. And he called us out of our life where we were and into, the, and into a life with him. That's why we're here today. Not one of us would know the other. We wouldn't know anybody in this church right now if it wasn't for those words, it is finished. And because of those words, and because of the words, all the promises in Ephesians 2, 18 and 19 are ours. Here's what Paul writes. He's talking to the Ephesians. He says, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then we are, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? A church is a called out assembly of people. It's not the building or the driveway or the location. It's the people. And you're called out. And as, you're, as a called out member, you are members of the household of God. That's your family. Actually, that's your first family. Because God says in his word that we're to love him above all things, including our own family. Why? Because he told us to do it. He made us members of his family. And not only members of the household of God, Romans 8, 15 says he went even further. He said, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. So not only did he just bring you into his house, he adopted you. He made you legal heirs with Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 17 says, if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You see, God doesn't do anything in a small way. He not only, he not only called you out of the world, he not only uh, gave you the benefits of, of all the promises in his world, in the world, he adopted you and he gave you the promises of being an heir with Christ. So I don't care what you own, 
I don't care if you have a billion dollars or you don't have 10 cents. I don't care. If you know Jesus Christ is your savior, you're the, one of the richest people in this world. There are so few people that understand the benefit of being called a believing Christian. Not a Christian. Christian is like saying uh, that I'm, I'm a man. Doesn't define me as being Brian. A believing Christian has more benefits in this world, not to mention the eternal world, in this world, than all the other people combined. And I don't care what you have. If you are outside of Christ, there's one thing, I'll give you one, just one right now. The one thing you have as a, a believing Christian is peace. The world can't buy that. They can't find that. It's nowhere there. You know why? Because they don't believe in Christ. They don't live for Christ. The peace you have comes from the fact that you know there's a God. You know you're a member of his family. You know that he's adopted you. And you know that he loved you enough to put his son on the cross for you. That brings you peace. There's nowhere else is going to get it. And what's that worth? What is that worth? Think about before you were lost what peace was worth. You had peace for what? A day, a week, a month, depending on how the checkbook balanced, depending on how you physically felt, depending on who was picking on you or not. Now you have peace all the time. The prayer that we just had was to give you peace. It's to say, yeah, these are the things that are troubling us. I'm leaving them with you. Give me the attitude of peace so that I can go back to my world and I can deal with these things with the right attitude. It is finished. Gave you the power to do that. All the supernatural power you need in the indwelling Holy Spirit to do that. On a practical level, it is finished, has a huge effect on your everyday life. To begin, it means that you're at peace with God. I don't know. I never really realized before I was saved that I was at war with God. I didn't care about God. Didn't want to talk about God. It was like, you know, I got other things to do. I'm not interested. But once I got saved, I understood that I was at war with him by my hostility towards him. That is what war is, isn't it? Hostility. And I was hostile to him. Well, Ephesians 5.1 says, after I got saved, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the power in peace? I want you to take that home and think about it this week. What power can I have in, in just having peace? And I'm not talking about conditional peace because everything is right. Having the peace and knowing that somebody's in charge of my life and they're running my life for my benefit even though sometimes it doesn't seem that way, especially when I'm bleeding or I'm crying or the checkbook is empty. But ultimately, because I believe I have the right attitude, it does, those things don't matter. I know he'll get me through it, and he'll get me through it with the right attitude. I talked to the class this morning about all of us as unsafe people, all, all of us has faced major things in our life that we said to ourselves, oh my word, I'm not, how am I going to get through this? How is this going to, how am I going to do this? And yet here we are today, you did do it. And you didn't do it on your own, even if you weren't saved. It was all by God's will. It, it means that you have, uh, that you're at peace with God, and it also means that heaven's storehouse is open to each and every one of us. Ephesians 1 3 makes that clear. Talking to God's chosen people. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The word all in there, if you look in the original Greek, means without exception. There's not one blessing that is in heaven that doesn't belong to a new Christian or to an old Christian. It doesn't matter. If you were saved for one minute, you have this, the moment you get saved, the moment that happens, you have all the blessings in heaven, just like somebody who's been there for 50 years. It's yours. It's all yours. It is finished means. It means we have victory in this life. Victory in this life. We have victory over the world. 
1 John 5, 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. If you're born again, you have victory over the world. The world tempts you, but you have the Holy Spirit inside of you countering that. Because all the world does is tempt your flesh. And when it tempts your flesh, right? When it does that, the Holy Spirit's saying no. What are you doing? Don't do that. Why? Because God wants you to be righteous and holy. And the way you do that is you live your life by letting him lead you. And when you, and when you do start to fall, the Holy Spirit is there to say, hey, 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 come on. How about that? How about victory over sin? Romans 6, 13, sin shall not have dominion over you. Did you understand that before you were saved, you were in bondage to sin? Do you understand that you had no choice, that everything you did was sin? The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him, which simply means that if you're doing anything without faith in God, then you're sinning. Why? Because you're doing it for yourself. That's the reason why. You're no longer in bondage. I never knew what that was when I was before I was saved. I use myself only because I, I can't use anybody else. But I didn't know I was in bondage to sin. If I wanted to do something and it was, let's just say it was uh, something God wouldn't approve of. I didn't think of God. I want to do it, so I'm going to do it. You could even say that about anything, morally, physically, any way at all. I never thought I was in bondage to it. But you know the funny thing about that? I never knew what good was. That's how I knew, found out I was in bondage to it. I didn't know good until I knew that cross and what that cross represented. Then I knew good. Now I know I was in bondage because I wasn't able to do good before. I was only able to do what the flesh wanted. Now I know evil, I know good, and I can make the choice. And I realize in doing that, that I really was in bondage. How about victory over death? Death's man's worst enemy. If you're not saved, death is the worst thing that can happen to you. Why? Well, I'm, I'm not going to be around anymore. <laughs> no, you're not going to be around anymore. It's been going on since, be, since Adam fell from uh, grace in, in the Eden, right? But the fact of the matter is, you have victory over death because when we die, we do not cease to, our soul and our spirit do not cease to exist. You don't believe it? Look in the Bible. Look at the rich man and Lazarus in Luke uh, chapter uh, chapter 10, or sec, I think it's 10 or 16. I forget which it is, but look it up. And you'll see, you'll see that you don't die. You remember things. So what dies? Your flesh. You were made from it. Ecclesiastes again says that when we die, the flesh returns to the dust and the spirit returns to the maker and that's exactly what happens it's finished it means also means if you know christ as uh, as your savior it means that you have victory over the lake of fire john three sixteen. for god so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life that means Everybody is convicted of sin because we come into this world with a sin nature. Doesn't mean we inherited the sin, but we have the nature to sin. And because of that, we do sin. But, but uh, John 3.16 is the bridge between your sin and the lake of fire. Speaking of the eternal life. I'm asking those of you that, uh, that are listening. Have you signed a peace treaty with God? Have you asked God to forgive your sins? Have you come to Jesus Christ and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you in many ways, and I'm heartily sorry that I did. I have a contrite heart. Search me, Lord, and you'll see my heart. And know that I'm a sinner, and I need your help. I don't want to go into eternity carrying only my sins. Romans 3.10 says we're all sinners. There's none that's righteous. No, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. I tell you that because many people have told me through the years, well, I'm a pretty good person. I do a lot for other people. I do this, I do that. 
The Bible says, and we got to go by that, it's the only authority we have. It says man's righteousness is as filthy rags. He will not accept your good deeds. I don't care if you live to be 100 trillion years old and you did good every single hour of those 100 trillion years. God would not accept it. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. Why do you think he sent him? There's some religions that believe you can baptize people and remove the sin. If that's the truth, why did he send him? He sent them to be a sin offering that God the Father will accept for your sins. There's no other way to do it. So if you're listening to this and you haven't asked God to, to forgive your sins, well, what are you waiting for? Nobody knows how long we have. What are we waiting for? All you have to do, wherever you are, is you just have to bow your head and in your heart really be sorry that what you've done, that I understand that there's a God now and I understand that I've offended him and God, I want you to know that I'm sorry that I offended you and please save me from my sins. Forgive me my sins. And I would ask you that in Jesus' name. That's it. That is the prayer of a sinner who wants to be saved. And then in Romans 10, 13, God's answer is this. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you have that in your heart and you truly want to be saved, God will not refuse you. You know why? Because the idea that you want God didn't come from you to begin with. He drew you to him. So what are you going to do? Are you going to go on and live your life the way you're doing it? You don't, none of these blessings we're talking about belong to you. You may think they do. You may not even believe in hell or the lake of fire. You will. You absolutely will. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't call on Christ to save you, that is your reality. You won't know that you're in bondage as you are now. You won't know that you're at war with God as you are now. You don't know that until you come out of it. It's sort of like vacations. I never knew I needed a vacation until I took one. <laughs> it's true. And you never know. Until you take a little time off from work because you're getting burned out. You take a little time off. And about the second day, you say, wow, what was I thinking? That's exactly true with repentance, with being understand of understanding that you're in bondage to sin, whether you want to believe it or not, and understanding that there is a hell. Most people believe in the devil. That's true. And he is. And it is true that he is. Uh, uh, there is a devil. You have a choice. You either live your life in the flesh as you're doing now, or you upgrade. You upgrade and you ask God to forgive you. And it's the simplest thing in the world. And you want to know the other thing that's amazing? It's a human thing. We've done it since we were children. Our mothers taught us and our dads taught us that we are to forgive other people. We're to love other people. And that's really what Christianity is about. It's about God forgiving you for what you've done against him and then imputing his love into you so you can go out and forgive other people. And you can be a light, a light, a gospel light that people see and say, oh, this person's different than us. What's different? Oh, he's been forgiven and now she forgives too. Do you understand that? If that's you and you want to know more about that, you see me after the service or call me, and I'll be more than happy to share more information on how God wants you to call upon him so that he can give you all the benefits that comes from those wonderful words. It is finished. Let that be the words that you leave here with today if you don't know Christ. The good news is, of course, there's a cross, uh, uh, the cross is the, the bridge across the lake of fire. Now, let's get back to our text. In our last section of the text, uh, he said, Jesus said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. <clears throat> the death of Christ uh, it, uh, is of great importance because of its supernatural uniqueness, number one, and the eternal benefits that comes to all of the people who follow Christ. For example, I'd have you note that Christ's death was a natural death. 
a natural death. It wasn't his crucifixion that took his life. I want you to understand that. The Romans didn't kill him. The Jews didn't kill him. John 10, 17. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. It was a natural death. And it was also a, re a, a real death. He literally died. They stuck a spear in his side. There was no pulse. There was nothing. He bled out. They took his body, his lifeless body, and they put it in, in, and they put it in a borrowed tomb. That body had no spirit or soul. It was just like your body and my body. Actually, that's why he became incarnate, because that's the only way God can die. He couldn't die any other way unless he was related to us as a human being. Now, the question asks is asked, and it's been asked of me many times, how is it possible, how is it possible that Jesus, who was the Son of God, how is it possible that he could die? Pretty good question. The answer is found in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14. I'll read it for you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh. There it is and dwelt among us. That's how he did it. He was God, still was God, took on flesh so that the flesh could die. And then that sacrifice, because of who he was, his blood was capable of paying our sin debt. It was only possible by him taking on human flesh that he could taste death and atone for our sins. And, as, and, and in addition to that, Christ's death was also, not only was it natural, it was also unnatural. Although Jesus died, the fact is death had no legal claim on him. Do you understand that? Death had no legal claim on him, and the reason why was above all thing is because he had no sin. The wages of sin and it, uh, says that uh, the wages of sin is death in Romans 6.23. But because he was sinless, death had no legal claim on him. It couldn't take him. Luke one thirty five. the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. And not only was Jesus born without sin, he lived his entire life without committing one sin. Tons of proof verses. 1 Peter 2, 2, uh, 22, he did no sin. 1 John 3, 5, he had no sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he knew no sin. 1 Peter 1, 19, he was without blemish and without spot. And even Pontius Pilate, in what we read this morning, could find no fault in him. There was no sin at all. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Couldn't have a le Didn't have a legal claim on it. Didn't. I would also note, have you note that Christ's death was preternatural. That means preordained to happen in eternity past. Ephesians 3.11 reveals that God anticipated man's fall from grace. He says, this was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. And because man's sin was against a, a, a holy, eternal God, the sacrifice to pay that sin debt to that holy, eternal God had to be spotless and the blood had to be eternal. Right? And Christ, who was sinless, is the only human being that ever walked this earth that had that blood type. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And lastly, Christ's death was supernatural. It was natural, it was unnatural, and it was also supernatural. And by that I mean his death was different from any other human death. 
Colossians 1.18 reminds us Jesus is preeminent because he's God. He's preeminent in everything. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, which means his virgin birth was different from all other births. Luke 1.35. His life was different than all other lives. 2 Timothy 1.10. And his death was different from all other deaths. John 10, 17 and 18. And I'll read that. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. And here it comes. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. His death was different. And that death was so different, it triggered Three supernatural events. They're found in Matthew 27, 51, 52. By the way, I give you guys all the doc, I mean, all the Bible verses because I want you to understand this isn't my opinion. This is what God says. In those verses, uh, 27, Matthew 27, 51, the first, the first supernatural event that, uh, that uh, it is finished triggered was the Holy of Holies. A three and a half inch woven or leather, whatever it was, I don't know, thick curtain was ripped from top to bottom. Man couldn't do that. And what, what was the purpose of that? To show there was no more temple worship. John 4.24, that's what John told, I mean, Christ told the woman at the well. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The temple's gone. The curtain's gone. The holy of holies are not there. Now, you, now his people are the temple. And that signaled access to God. That's what it signaled. And, and before that, only the high priest could go in once a year. Now we can all go. We just went to God this morning, just a little while ago. Access to God has been opened through the bo broken body of Jesus Christ. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the light. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. He is the way. There is no other way. Secondly, the same verse testifies that the earth quaked. Not an earthquake, but the entire earth shook at its creator because when, it, when its creator gave up the ghost. Someone has written, the entire earth was shaken to its very foundation and rocked on its axis as though to show it was horrified at the most awful deed that had ever been perpetrated on its surface. That's true. And nature herself gave way as the rocks, the Bible says the rocks cracked and crumbled before the supernatural power or before the supernatural power of Jesus Christ's death. And thirdly, when Jesus test, uh, died, Matthew testifies, the tombs were, all, were opened and many bodies of the saint who had fallen asleep were raised. You know why those bodies were raised from the dead? They were living memorials to Christ's victory over death, over sin. And you know what else? You and I are living memorials of what he did when he said it is finished. We are living memorials just as those people were. All these events, all these events were a witness to the supernatural character of Jesus Christ's death. With the words, it is finished, the great purpose God had for mankind was accomplished. All that the Redeemer came to do was done. And when Christ saw that all was accomplished, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. The love of God for his elect people was fully demonstrated in the cross and in our Lord's final words. Beyond any doubt, I tell each of you the words, it is finished, are the only reason you're sitting here this morning.
you would not be here if they weren't if they weren't said. In closing, I leave you with John 11, 25, 26, which tells you why the three simple words it is finished are the greatest words ever spoken on earth. Here's why. Jesus speaking, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Let's pray.